But uh, yes, welcome to this Better Off Out EU and U session. And uh, it's ascribed as the EU and U because the Better Off Out campaign is concerned with the people across the UK and how the European Union is affecting our daily lives. And the campaign itself is looking to drive that home across the UK uh, with examples to illustrate how the European Union is increasing the prices of our daily uh, grocery bills, increasing the costs of our travel, increasing the costs of our energy, as well as, of course, the life outside the European Union. And I'm delighted uh, to be joined with a fantastic panel of guests this afternoon uh, that will be talking about the effect of the European Union on individuals, as well as how the European Union has changed and is changing. Because, of course, we want to be up to date with these things. We want to know the up-to-date information on what's happening and how it's affecting our own lives. And I'll just briefly introduce the panel as they sit, um, and they will have five and ten minutes to talk about uh, their particular area of interest. We start off with Ruth Lee, who is a, an executive director, I believe, of our Bathnot Banking Group, but also has had a many years experience in the city and is part of, uh, one of the founding members, I believe, of business or the Economists for Britain Group. We then move on to David campbell Banman, MEP, who joins us uh, talking about taking the fear out of Brexit and his EA light plan. And then uh, Ian Murray from the Competitive Enterprise Institute, a US-based think tank that uh, in many ways mirrors the principles and desires of the Freedom Association in the fact that about free trade and, of course, commerce and uh, connections throughout the world without particular legal entities getting involved. Finally, last but not least, will be uh, Lee Rotherham. Lee is an academic, but also a staunch supporter of the Better Off Out campaign, I believe. Uh, he has also been involved with Eurosceptic policies and politics for a number of years, and we are delighted to have him on the panel to share his wealth of experience of how the European Union is affecting everyday individuals. But ladies first, start off with Ruth Lee, please. Thank you very much. I'll stand here. I'll stand on the step and then you can see me. Uh, it's not the naughty step, I hope. It's not the uh, no, well, I thought, uh, as, as Rory suggested, that I'll talk about how the EU is changing and will continue to change and the serious implications of that. I think the first thing to say, of course, is that the EU is not the power in the world that it used to be. Certainly not economically and I suspect not anything else either. But in 1918, the IMF figures go back to 1980, the EU 28 is now constituted, comprised over 30% of the world economy. By 2012-2013, it was down to about 19%. And if the IMF projections are anything like accurate, it will have fallen further to less than 17% by 2018-2019. I mean, as you can see, it's in a secular relative decline. And it was funny, as I was at some uh, debate last night, and uh, somebody talked about the decline of the EU, and the German ambassador got very exercised by this remark and said, it is relative decline. <laughs> <laughs> saw that, relative decline. So we all agreed it was in relative decline, which sounds like decline to me, but there you go. Uh, <laughs> and of course, it goes without saying that looking forward, one of the reasons why the continued relative decline of the EU is because the growth prospects are so absolutely dreadful. Part of this is to do with the, the dysfunctional Eurozone, which I suspect will continue to muddle through for the conceivable future, much, much to the pain of the particular citizens within those countries, but they chose it, and I'm afraid to say that's how it will be while the political uh, elites in those countries are so absolutely de dedicated to the project. So there will be, even up to, say, the, the IMF figures go up to 2018, 2019, 
But looking forward uh, as one, or looking ahead, I don't know whether it says actually looking forward or looking ahead, I'm sure the German ambassador would be able to correct me on that one as well. <laughs> but looking ahead into the 2020s and 2030s, if you think that somehow the working population is in some way correlated with growth potential, then of course there's very, very bad news for a lot of the European countries that have positively appalling demographics. Uh, their popular German population is set to fall, uh, but its working population, aged between 16 and 64, although there are some of us that are slightly older than that, and we will work for a substantial few years yet. But taking 16 to 64, then the working population in Germany is almost set, set to drop dramatically. You're talking about 20 or 30 percent uh, by 2050. So needless to say, when you have a situation like that, the growth prospects of that country in the medium to longer term are very, very weak. Now, we know this, and we know that Europe is in relative decline. And it's interesting how, of course, this has implications for our trade. And if one of the reasons for being in the EU is trade, then suffice to say the importance and the size of their economy is relevant. And already, you know, in spite of the allure and the, uh, so the I was going to say, the, uh, the, we keep hearing about the attractiveness, uh, almost Lorelei-like, of the single market. Uh, we keep hearing about the siren voices of the advantages of being in the single market. But even so, you will find if you look at total UK exports to the world, the share going to the EU is dropping really quite quickly. In uh, about 2002, well it was 2002, so I don't know why I said about 2002, and I really must be more Germanic about these things. <laughs> In 2002, uh, the EU share of exports of goods and services was about 55%. Uh, by 2012, it was actually down to 45%. And again, it was interesting last night when I pointed this out to somebody, somebody said, oh, well, the EU's had a rather rough time over the last 10 years. I said, well, look forward for the next 10 years. And I'm afraid to say the lady in question could not disagree with me. And so with the 45%, but actually there's an organisation, of course, called the OECD, that's actually looked at what they call trading value added as opposed to the conventional trade accounts. And they, they take into account all the intermediate imports and exports. And of course, if you think about a, an export of a car, it's got a lot of imported goods into it. And I, rather than going into any more detail, I will very happily explain it to people afterwards if they really want to know. But the OECD figures in, in value added show that in fact the trade with the EU is even less important than the conventional accounts uh, suggest. It could be down to 40% or even less. And at that sort of stage, you've got talking about a share of in exports to the EU of perhaps 10% of GDP. That is all. 10% affected by trade to the EU, 100% of the economy, of course, affected by the regulations within the EU. And, I mean, thinking again back to last night, it, it was principally a debate about uh, financial services in the city. And of course, how many times have you heard that the city is all in favour of staying in the EU? Well, we heard it many times last night, let's put it that way. Uh, mind you, four out of five members of the panel were Europhiles, so what can you expect? There was one sole uh, brave Eurosceptic. But uh, the, the, what, more to the point, you have to say, you know, what, what is it about, again, the EU that they find so enticing and irresistible? Well, again, it's the magic words, the single market. But I must admit, when I, I'm afraid I was rather, rather uh, provocative last night, which is really very out of character. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I was uh, allowed to uh, ask a question. So I duly stood up and said, um, you talk about the single market and how necessary it is to complete the single market in, sing in financial services, whatever that might mean. I, I have no idea really what they mean by that, but there you go. The single market is essential, essential for trade, they said, essential for trade. I said, but look, let me think about this. I actually looked at the ONS website because one of my uh, jobs in life, I was uh, actually a government statistician. Uh, boy, it shows, doesn't it? But it means that I can actually wade my way through the ONS website, which is not uh, the sort of thing that most young ladies do on a Sunday afternoon, but there we go. And I did find the exports of financial services and insurance. And in fact, the figures go back to 2004. 
And in 2004, the share of financial services exports, including insurance, to the EU, the share was about 37%. Think about that, 37%. Now, this is where I get clever and suggest that actually 63 went to the non-EU. It's 37 and 63 being 100. Ha <laughs> ha. But interestingly, by 2012, that share had dropped to 33 and a half. In other words, only a third of the exports of financial service and insurance went to the EU. The magic powers of the single market. And so I pointed this out to people and I said, when you talk about the absolute vital importance of the, uh, of the single market, could it be that it's not so important after all? And that in fact, far more important to trade prospects and export possibilities and potential is actually having expanded markets. Well, I must admit this came as a shock to the Europhiles, who had not expected anybody to ask this question, never mind look the figures up. But one of the responses was fascinating, and it tells you everything about the Europhiles argument. He said, because he was really not quite sure how to respond to this, but then he said, well, the important thing about being in the single market is that it then enables you to trade with non-EU countries. <laughs> And I had to think about this quite hard. <laughs> and he said, it's all these trade agreements that if we left the single market, they would all become invalid. Well, I'm not sure about that, but we'll have to check up on that later. And then he said, all these trade agreements like the US and China. Now, this is your start for 10. Do we currently have a free trade agreement with China? No. Do we currently have a free trade agreement with the United States of America? No. You are right on both occasions. So, to cut a long story short, he's talking nonsense. <laughs> but there we are. But there's another, of course, aspect to the changing uh, EU that does have implications for Britain, and that is uh, back to the somewhat beleaguered Eurozone. That, uh, as I say, assuming this, uh, this uh, currency block continues to muddle through, actually, I think it will continue to expand because such is the political will of the financial, of the political elites within such a lot of the new countries, of the new Eastern, Central and Eastern European countries, is that they will be very, very keen to join and be part of the top table. But inevitably this will mean that those countries will have to get closer and closer together, even if there isn't fiscal union tomorrow, and I suspect there won't be fiscal union tomorrow because uh, understandably the German taxpayer doesn't want to pay the whole bill. But it, there will be further integration by way of institutions, about the way they think about the EU. And indeed, for those countries that are not in the EU, I think it's going to be harder and harder not to be marginalised. And that will affect, it will affect Britain and its trade and its influence, not least of all in the financial services. And again, thinking all about the financial services, um, Last, again, last night, there was a lot of conversation and discussion about uh, the, uh, the regulations in financial services that are so troublesome for a lot of the businesses. Fair enough, I think a point was made that a lot of the financial regulation does come through from G20 and it does come through from the UK regulatory authorities. But there are also uh, regulations and restrictions coming through that are no doubt disadvantaging the city of London as a financial centre. Now, I, I know that uh, bankers are not very popular people, and when you start talking about bankers' bonuses of about 200 or 500,000 pounds a year, it doesn't actually get uh, much sympathy. I, I, I accept that. But even so, I mean, for, for a lot of banks in the city that have to trade and compete globally, not to have the flexibility in their remuneration policies that perhaps they have in Singapore or Hong Kong or New York, and after all, this is where you're competing. You're not competing in Frankfurt or Paris. You're competing with these international centres. To have the, your flexibility, your remuneration so hampered by uh, Brussels is certainly disadvantageous. And there are other developments which I think are rather concerning. Uh, the ECB, the European Central Bank, which is due to become the supervisory authority of a lot of the Eurozone banks, it is already proposing that there should be certain restrictions in the location of certain clearing houses, and those restrictions, those clearing houses should be located 
within the eurozone. In other words, they're saying to London, for certain products, euro denominated products, I'm sorry, you're not good enough. We want the clearing houses to be located in the eurozone. Now, if that isn't breaking up the integrity of the single market, I don't know what is. Uh, in fact, it is breaking up the integrity of the single market. Let's not beat around the bush. And I suspect that that is, in a way, always the first step towards where the Eurozone will take itself as a, as a sort of unit within the EU, EU28, that can only become more and more integrated to the cost of the non-EU country, the non-Eurozone countries. So I think all in all, yes, we're in a situation where the EU is changing. Two very profound changes. A, it's a relative secular decline, please note. And secondly, the Eurozone will integrate to the cost, I think, of the non-Eurozone members. These are very profound, very profound tendencies, and I can't see any sign that they will be reversed. And when people talk about the status quo uh, being in the EU, I don't think the status quo is an option. Eurozone will change it. The status quo of we have now won't be relevant anymore. It be what we will be seeing over the next five to ten years. And that, I think, is where I'm going to finish uh, as my introduction to the changing EU. Now, over to uh, David Campbell Badman for his uh, thoughts on the next steps. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you to a very distinguished panel here and to the Freedom Association and all those involved in this meeting. I have to say, I haven't been ever felt so popular as at the, being at this conference, where I, of course, am the guy who's come back from UKIP to the Conservative. Uh, I have no intention of going off to Doncaster and surprising everyone either. So um, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here, and I'm very much an advocate of an EU referendum, an in-out referendum, uh, 2017 or, or even before. Um, and I thought what I'd do for this session uh, is just look at our relationship with the EU, should we actually leave it and adopt what I call an EEA light agreement. This is the book I've written which uh, sets us out called Time to Jump. Nothing to do with uh, defection, by the way, it is actually to do with <laughs> leaving the EU, I hasten to add. Um, and this is the British lobster on the front being slowly, slowly boiled alive by a Belgian cook. Uh, you know, and of course, um, even Hitler used a frog metaphor that you slowly boil the lobster or the frog uh, so that they don't actually know what's happening to them. And I think this is where we are at the moment in terms of the EU and you. Uh, I'd like to see a, a better option than this one. Um, if I may just paint uh, the idea of what um, I would advocate in EA light. I mean, I say light in the sense of, you know, like Coke regular and Coke light. It's a lighter form of the EEA agreement, which you probably well know is what Norway has with the EU and Iceland and Liechtenstein. And I think we need a British model that sits between the Swiss model, which is 120 bilateral trade agreements. It's very complex. And by the way, the problem of the Swiss model, though it's more democratic, is you don't have access, you're talking about the City of London, it doesn't have a capital, freedom of capital and freedom of services element to it. Uh, it has goods and it has peoples, but not the other two freedoms. Whereas Norway has the four freedoms. Um, but I, what I would say is obviously the big issue at the moment is the freedom of peoples issue. We heard from Theresa May earlier. Um, and immigration is a major issue. And even the Swiss had a referendum. I did get involved to some extent. Um, it was all in German, German radio. And they narrowly voted for an end to mass immigration, which I thought was wonderful, because actually it causes chaos. And the EU is really in, uh, very worried about this, because the Swiss are the third largest trading partner, of course, with the EU. Um, but it just shows you they've opted for that. And what I would suggest is you have a model under EA Light where you have uh, freedom of goods, services and capital, which is pretty respectable, but you have a freedom of workers rather than the freedom of peoples. And this is what the Swiss want, really, is, you know, the ability to control mass immigration. You want people to come into the country, it's good for the country, but you've got to control the numbers. You know, there are, it is out of control, 
from the EU, and there's no way of sort of limiting it effectively, whilst you have this freedom of people's law. Um, now, the the EA agreement. I mean, I was sitting in the. I'm on this EEA joint parliamentary committee, which is between the European Parliament and Switzerland, Norway, Liechtenstein, and Iceland. And so I was sitting there, and I thought, well, why don't we take the EA agreement? which is a 20-year-old agreement. It, it's considered very successful. Everyone thinks it's successful, even the EU. Uh, it's hardly been changed. It, uh, it was uh, 20 years old in January. And even Jacques Delors, bless him, came up with this, would you believe? As in, up yours, Delors. You remember the headline from The Sun? Uh, he actually came up with this agreement, and it has worked well. But the problem with it is uh, you have to sign up to a lot of the single market regulations, and that gets you into the lack of influence argument uh, and this lack of control over immigration. So what I am advocating is that Britain actually has something very similar uh, to the EA agreement, but you opt out of the single market. And now, if you opt out of the single market, a lot of the problems, a lot of the arguments against leaving the EU go because as Ruth rightly said, it's only about 10%, even 8% of our economy is trade with the EU. And therefore you unlock by definition, in theory, 90% to 92% of the rest of your economy that's nothing to do with trade with the EU. And you know, the key point is 80% of the British economy is trade within UK, like Scottish whiskey being drunk in enormous quantities here in Birmingham at the conference. It, that is the UK economy at work, and it's nothing to do with the EU. And you could strip out one of the main benefits of leaving the EU is not the 12 billion net contributions, that's very helpful. It is actually the 150,000 pages of ACQUI, of the EU laws, the working time directive that's crucifying the NHS. Uh, you know, 12 billion pounds in position, that's one directive on our economy. It's the Temporary Workers Directive, it's the, the REACH Chemicals Directive, you name it, it gets worse and worse. We've got the Ports Directive coming in that's going to crucify our ports. You know, it goes on, I, you know, you can't keep up with it. Sulphur Directive, it's just closed the ferry route between Harwich and uh, Esbia that's been running since 1875. Because the EU in its wisdom wants to increase fuel costs for ships by 87% to cut sulphur down to 0.1%. Well, that's a pretty good example of a bad EU law that, frankly, if we're not in, if we're in an EA-like type situation, we're out of the single market, we can scrap and get rid of. And I think it's that red tape burden if we can actually slash that back. Um, obviously, it's not cash, but it will lead to more profitability, more taxes, um, the ability to cut taxes, to deregulate big time within the UK. And I think that's one of the main benefits of such an arrangement. Um, the, the key point about this as well is, you know, what I'm suggesting here, Light, is you take a proven agreement, as I mentioned, you know, been working for 20 years, and you twin it with what they say in the Lisbon Treaty. Under Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty, it actually requires the EU, it doesn't ask them, it requires the EU to negotiate a, what they call a withdrawal agreement, with any departing member from the EU. And if I may just quote the terms of that, that's Article 50, Clause 2, it states the union, that's the EU, uh, shall negotiate and conclude an agreement with that withdrawing state, uh, setting out the arrangement for its withdrawal, uh, taking account of the framework for its future relationship with the union. Now, to me, that's important because David Cameron is talking about renegotiation, and I support that. I think that is feasible. I don't think it will go far enough for me, to be honest. But what I'm saying is that actually this is very powerful. If you actually agree to leave the EU, the EU will have to negotiate what is effectively a comprehensive trade, economic and political agreement with the UK. And of course it should do because we're the largest single customer of the other EU 27 nations. Would that they'd be mad to encourage tariffs on cars. You know, 73% of our cars on Britain's roads are made in the rest of the EU. And I have to say, it's a bit cheeky of Ford to say we can't leave the EU. 
when they only make 1,300 cars a year now, 1,300 cars a year, and we import up to 270,000 Ford cars from the rest of the EU. You can see why they're worried about us leaving the EU, <laughs> because they want access to our market, never mind, you know, Ford's being exported from here. Um, but the point about uh, this, and Ruth is excellent at this, and you know she's done a fantastic job, and she's such a brilliant and trade figures and, and economics. But but you know she rightly makes the point. You know the reality has changed. When we joined in the 60s, 70s, it was a different ball game. But we now export more to the rest of the world, 12 percent to the rest of the world. It's only 8 percent, as I say, of our economy. 40 percent of our exports go to the EU, and it's dropping. They're actually forecasting it coming down to about 5%. So we've got to look globally and be less regional. And frankly, the Eurozone is stagnant, uh, and it isn't going to uh, change for many years. So let's be global about this and look beyond the EU. Um, in fact, really, all we need, surely, is a trade agreement. We don't, you know, that's what the British people thought we were getting back in 1975, isn't it? That's all we really want. We don't want employment law. We don't want an EU single army. I'm on the Defence Committee, and my God, they do want an EU single army and go to war with uh, Russia and Ukraine, by the way. But, you know, we don't want all those aspects. We just want the trade. We want access for, for UK exporters from the city, from manufacturers, Jaguar, to the EU single market. And I think this would deliver it. Um, I would suggest, I mean, again, talking about influence, you have an EU-UK joint committee meeting every three months. This would be like a mini-summit. And we've already got a model of it because you've got an EU-Swiss joint committee that meets every three months and agrees a lot of cooperation with the EU. So that's the sort of model we could, we could have. Um, just briefly, just to wrap up, I, I, I mentioned the £12 billion pounds net contributions. Well, if you actually look... There's a lot of nonsense spoken about this, but if you actually ask the Norwegians and the Swiss, which I did for my film, which was shown earlier, but you know, I was actually interviewing them on this, and actually their contributions are far, far lower than ours are. We have gross contributions to the EU of about 20 billion. We have farming payments back of our own money. We have uh, regional grants back out of, our, of our own money. But you know, 12 billion pounds a year could be a go to tax cuts, reducing debt, it is, if you want to spend it on hospitals, it's 81 new hospitals a year, or 488 sc new schools a year. We're just giving away every year. Uh, so I think um, this is the way to go. And actually, the EA agreement can be altered. It's, uh, it's on the website. If you want to see a track changes version, I'm surprised how easy it was, or was embarrassed how easy it was. But I did get the professor of European law at LSE, Damon Chalmers to look at it, and he said it was perfectly legally feasible, which I took as high praise. And Lord Lamont did the forward, and again he says he talks of a lot of false arguments about staying in the EU, and it's all totally overrated. So that's in the book too. But finally, I would say this: that you know, it's not black and white in or out with the EU, because Switzerland and Norway sign up to a lot of EU programs. And we could do the same should we wish to. I wouldn't recommend many of them, to be honest. But, you know, for example, the European Medicines Agency. You can pay a fee to the European Medicines Agency and remain a member of it without being the EU. Uh, or the Aviation Safety Agency. There's a number of aspects, but I don't want to be in the Galileo programme, which is a complete waste of time, and it, it gets worse and worse, and it still hasn't delivered, and we're throwing money down the drain there, just so we can be like America. That's a EU model. So it's a bit pick and choose, but I hope you find this is a positive alternative. And finally, I'll just make the point that, look, I've just come back from Scotland. I was there for two weeks fighting for the, the union that really counts, the British Union. Um, but, you know, the reality there is Alex Salmon's plan, 600-page blueprint, came apart. It was too vague. It wasn't watertight. You cannot have three Plan Bs, as he, as he had on the currency, um, so we need a plan to win an EU referendum. We need a plan that is watertight, that paints a more positive picture outside the EU. Uh, and I hope that EA Light might actually meet that expectation. Thank you very much.
Thank you, David. And we've just seen uh, a couple of examples of how the EU is changing and how it's affecting your life. Um, and more so also because of the, uh, the jobs that are uh, not created are, in fact, impeded from being created uh, by the onerous regulations uh, that the UK is currently under. Now, it's uh, my absolute pleasure to introduce Ian Murray to talk about the EU and you and rights. Thank you very much, Rory. Uh, I come from the Competitive Enterprise Institute in the United States, and we believe in competition, so there's going to be a little bit of competition here with David. Uh, Rory and I t together wrote uh, an entry for the Brexit Prize called Cutting the Gordian Knot, a uh, roadmap for British exit from the European Union, which takes a slightly different approach. We believe fundamentally that uh, Britain should be a completely independent state and should uh, re remove itself from all the uh, EU treaties and operate as an independent state under the World Trading Organization model. So uh, if, you, if you want to read a bit more about that, uh, you can find this uh, Cutting the Gordian Knot on the Institute of Economic Affairs website, iea.org.uk. And I thought I'd, I'd just underline something that, uh, that David said about the cost of regulation to the United Kingdom. <coughs> Patrick Minford has been doing a lot of work on the cost of regulation to the UK for, for many years. And he came up with, with, with the range of uh, the cost of regulations at about 6 to 25% of GDP. When you put that down to the household level, let's just look at the lower bound. That cost is about £5,000 per household per year. The median income of a household in the United Kingdom is £22,000. So it is a really significant cost, costing each and every household in the United Kingdom just under a quarter of its, of its annual income. It's reduced by that amount because of the reasons Rory mentioned, all the jobs that are, that, that, that are not being created, all the wealth that is not being created because of the burden on the economy. And this figure is not out of line. Some people have suggested that it's, oh, it's, it, it, that's over the top. My organisation does an annual survey of the cost of regulation to the United States. And uh, the, the, the new figures have just come out. And it, the cost of regulation in the United States, which is a less regulated <coughs> society. It's still very heavily regulated, but it's much less heavily regulated than, than, than the European Union. It's about $1.8 trillion, which represents about 11% of US GDP. So that £5,000... That lower bound figure is almost certainly an underestimate. It is much more likely to be up in the £10,000 range. And when you think about that as a cost on the, uh, on the household, you realise quite what a crushing burden regulation is and why we have to do something about it pretty desperately. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I have a confession to make. As a, as a representative of an American think tank, I don't just come to the United Kingdom. Sometimes I go to continental Europe. I spend a lot of time over there in, uh, in Germany, for instance, uh, with the, uh, the Friedrich Naumann Foundation that I work with quite closely. And I actually have a pen, a German pen here, uh, which has Freiheit.org on it. Freiheit being the German word for freedom. Last night, I had the pleasure of having dinner with a colleague of mine from France. Uh, Pierre Gallo, who runs the Institute of Economic Studies Europe. And whenever I talk to these excellent gentlemen, these good classical liberals, Whigs almost, I always ask them, so why do you like being in the European Union? And they always say, well, it's because it's given us a guarantee of, of individual rights for the first time, something that we never had previously. And this is the fundamental difference between the United Kingdom's and the United Kingdom and the European countries in, uh, in being members of the European Union. They had no tradition of individual rights. They now get them guaranteed by the European Union. We had a long and story tradition of individual rights, and they are being taken away by the European Union. And that is the fundamental difference. I, I thought I'd go over a, a few of the basic rights that would have been recognised at the end of the 18th century on either side of the Atlantic. 
As Donald Blaney noted this morning, most of these are codified in the US Bill of Rights and the US Constitution. And the first and most important one is freedom from arbitrary government and uh, prerogative. The people of America, as, Englishmen, uh, as Englishmen as they regarded themselves in the 1770s, uh, fundamentally believed that liberties were not the grants of princes or parliaments and that the executive branch must be controlled. That's what the entire Constitution of the United States was originally about. That's what the Bill of Rights was originally about, to control the executive, to put a break, a, a break on the executive so it couldn't do the sort of things that English kings had a tendency to do, to pull it back. And that's what, uh, uh, there's, there's a great Italian philosopher called Bruno Leone who has gone back and looked at the uh, the, the, the evolution of the English Parliament. It's interesting that it takes an Italian to realise this, that the, 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 the English Parliament did not just evolve as a legislative body. It also evolved as a break on the executive, telling kings, no, you can't do that. Let's go back to the rights of, uh, that, that we knew in the Anglo-Saxon time. So you see this repeated time and time again throughout early English constitutional history. The uh, Charter of Liberties of Henry I, was all about, let's get back to those great liberties of the, of the Englishman. Magna Carta, which we've heard about so much. The Declaration of Right. Even the Chartist movement of the 19th century was all about this. Uh, all about stopping the executive from going out of control. The EU is based on completely the reverse principle. The executive has all the power in the EU. The executive has the sole right of a legislative initiative. This is completely the reverse of the English system. That is why, as members of the EU, we are seeing our first and foremost liberty as Englishmen being taken away from us. Uh, sorry, I, I noticed Brian here. I should say British. <laughs> British. Um, something like qualified majority voting. It is fundamentally un-British. Then we have freedom of speech. Freedom of speech, again, a very, very important part of British uh, constitutional history. You look at that great work, Areopagitica, by John Milton, the defense of free speech uh, at, the, at the time of, of the English Revolution in the, in the 1640s. We see that being erased by the European <laughs> Union. The right to be forgotten. No person at either the Freedom Zone or the Conservative Party should believe in the right to be forgotten. Well, perhaps Brooks Newmark might. <laughs> but <laughs> the right to be forgotten, the idea that there, is a comp uh, that, that there should be some control over the press and over, even more importantly, over that great democratization of information, the internet, as to what information should be available, what you can say on the internet, again, it is fundamentally un-British, and, fun and that is what the EU is doing. It is threatening freedom of speech. Then we have what I, I would call the right to be secure in your person, the, uh, the, the right to be free from uh, unjust seizure, seizure, everything that the uh, Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments to the US Constitution is all about, habeas corpus, all that sort of thing. We've heard many times, so I don't need to go into it in great detail, but we've heard many times uh, in the Freedom Zone from, from Rory, from Christopher Gill, about the European arrest warrant. Again, that is a fundamental breach of British liberty. Then we have another concept that the European Union has reversed, another British concept the European Union has reversed. The concept of reserved rights. When you look at the European constitutional document that was the, the subject of the referenda uh, about a decade ago, you saw it, that it enumerated rights and reserved powers to the EU. That is the reverse of the Anglosphere constitutional settlement, which enumerates, uh, enumerates powers, says what the executive can do, what the legislative branch can do, um, whether it be the royal prerogative or the, 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 the powers of the United States president, and it reserves rights. All the right, under the British system, 
you have the right to do anything that isn't illegal. Under the US system, you have reserved rights to the people from the Constitution. And this gets into another fundamental principle of British liberty, which was uh, articulated very well by Dominic Raab this morning, the idea of positive against negative liberty. We here in the United Kingdom, in the United States, in Australia, and Canada, we all have our rights set out as freedom from the government doing something to you, negative liberty. Whereas the EU wants positive liberty, say you have the freedom to X, Y, or Z. In the, once you reverse those, you're again destroying the fundamental concept of British individual rights. The fact is that the EU is in the process of destroying liberty in this country. These values were passed down for over a thousand years from, uh, in that progression I mentioned earlier. The EU has destroyed that heritage, aided and abetted, I should add, by Shirley Williams, in about 40 years. That is something that we have got to reverse. We still have the time to do it, and we can reverse it. And that's why I suggest that the, uh, when it comes to the referendum, here's a good model for the question that should, needs to be agreed to. Might sound familiar to those of you who are familiar with American history. That the United Kingdom is, and of right, ought to be a free and independent state, and that all ties between the United Kingdom and the European Union are irrevocably dissolved. I think that might be a winning question. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Ian. Um, now over to Lee. Mic's up, ready to go. Uh, I've just broken the mic, so uh, <laughs> it's a good start, isn't it? <laughs> Is uh, this one working? I think so, I think so. I'll tell you what, I'll do my Sergeant Major voice and shout out very loudly. Um, well, thank you, Roy. Uh, it's... Um, it's always a pleasure to uh, attend these uh, Freedom Zone events. Uh, this is, uh, always has been, a veritable speakeasy speak of the soul, and in the very nature of its attendees, uh, a place for the Carla Brunis rather than the Carlos Dangers of this world. <laughs> so thank you, Simon, and the team for organising this debate today. Now, I, I hate to have to do this to you, but I'm going to disappoint you from the very go-get. This, ses this session is entitled The EU and you. But the EU isn't about you. It isn't about you at all. Or me. Or him. Certainly not her. <laughs> and on so many levels. <laughs> Let's start with the history. Uh, you know this already. The Founding Six set up the club as a trading arrangement to keep Germany's warfighting material, the coal and steel, in international hands. No longer would Daimler be able to outbuild Renault. At sea, Dreadnought races would ultimately yield to Ted Heath's yacht. If you like, it was a Panzerfaustian pact. German industry would rebuild by being allowed market access by the less bombed yet protectionist French. In return, the outnumbered French, who had spent the previous 200 years panicking about their relative decline in population, would gain a new type of informal reparations in the shape of sponsorship for their traditional rural heartlands. Swords for plowshares? Well, crops for camembert. Cam camembert, maybe. Uh, if you want evidence of this, I was in Germany last week, and what did I find in the shop? German camembert. 80, 80 cents. Very good with a rough red wine. <laughs> Benelux, of course, swapped failed neutrality for affiliation. Italy, for its part, finally stepped into the European Major League, or at least onto their coattails. But above all, it offered everyone a solution to the big problem of the day. The French had occupied and tried to carve off the industrial heartland of Germany on no, fewer on no fewer than three occasions after 1918 and had failed. They had tried to biff the Germans in three massive wars and had failed. They even twice tried political union with England, in the UK I should say, in 1940 and 1956 and failed. That last experience, Suez, pushed the Quai d'Orsay into the place where we're at today. They Germanised while we Americanised. So far, to be fair, it has worked for them, but of course, at a price. This approach is entirely logical. It's all based on a problem that's been around since Julius Caesar. What to do with a dominant power at the heart of the continent when they politically and culturally unite. That's not parroting Nick Ridley. It's paraphrasing what Albert and Victoria's marriage policy was all about with their daughter Vicky and a liberal future Kaiser. Sadly, he swiftly died, 
and we, when you, and we ended up with our son Chippy Kaiser Bill instead, and all that followed down to 1945. So, the founding premise of European integration wasn't about anyone in this room, or I should hope not, as there'd be an international arrest warrant about to be served. <laughs> Nor, though, is the EU about you philosophically today. Of course, the German factor is not the only motivation. There are the dreamers, the idealists. Some want to build a new country and forge new identities, creating a superpower to stand up for their belief systems against other emerging and declining superpowers across the world. Fair enough. That's one vision. It's not mine. It may well not be yours either. Then there are the pessimists, those in government who consider this country a lost cause. Their view is that as a nation, it is a doom to be sat at rather than at the head of the top table. They reflect on the pomp of yesterday being one with Nineveh and Tyre. Their great-great-great-grandfathers probably read de Tocqueville's predictions about the future rise of America and Russia and the relative decline of the Western <coughs> European powers and considered applying to join Austro-Hungary. Like the Stanleys in Elizabeth I's day, such individuals would rather be a great noble in someone else's court than a petty king of their own. They are happy to surrender their freedom and independence and become vassals, yielding supreme to lesser power in order to have a simple share in the council of a greater empire. I don't think the Stanleys asked the residents of the Isle of Man for their opinion either. Both these groups have something in common. They also are not you. Worse, both the dreamers and the pessimists across government striving for a country called Europe deep down despise you. They follow the algebra of despair. They want to build Europe despite you and contrary to you and against you. In their mantra, their doctrine, you will come to love their new, your new identity, for it is destiny and it is rational and it is ordained. Yet democracy has delivered an unfortunate track record in providing the wrong answers when the people are asked if they want to go along with this plan. The pathway of European integration is littered with referendum IEDs. This, of course, is very awkward. It's difficult enough getting agreement from 28 bureaucracies. It's even more tricky when the relevant ministers might also occasionally have an opinion and challenge otherwise done deals amongst foreign ministries whose own task is merely to monitor and control the flow, not to damn it. How much more frustrating must be to see agreements that have been thrashed out so assiduously coming unstuck because of the wretched public. Brecht, of course, famously wrote, the people had forfeited the confidence of the government and could win it back only by redoubled efforts. Would it not be easier in that case for the government to dissolve the people and elect another? <laughs> Repeatedly, by sending referendum ballots back to the same voters who had previously rejected them, or indeed by passing them completely, or simply through the silent expediency of reneging on referendum pledges altogether. Repeatedly, as I say, it appears that the European elite have taken Brecht at his word. Perhaps I am being a little unfair here in saying that you are not a stakeholder. Brussels does listen. Well, it listens to some. Is there anyone here today from the European Tropical Tuna Fishing and Processing Committee? <laughs> Don't lie. <laughs> What about the Centre for Non-Formal Education? The Belarus EU Business Centre? Butterfly, Butterfly Conservation Europe? The European Institute for Social Protection? Maybe we're being too campaign specific. How about the European Power Tool Association? The European Concrete Paving Association? The European Association for the Service Treatment of Aluminium? The European Association of aquatic mammals. I am disappointed. Perhaps they're all too busy in the bars of Excel. The point is, the structure of decision making lends itself supremely to lobbying. It is a, a beaver lodge of division, favouring insiders while keeping everyone else out in the wilderness in the cold. But Brussels is far more than the celebrated global epicentre of lobbying, Washington DC. There's more than just those trade lobbies complaining quite understandably, that some draft legislation is going to add costs to manufacturing and ruin their competitive edge. There are the mental mercenaries as well. The organisations, Brussels, using your tax money, pays to talk to Brussels. 
The courtiers subsidise to tell the monarch that his nakedness is made up of fine clothes. The campaign groups enthrall to the organisation to which they get special privileged access as favoured consultants of choice. What the IEA calls sock puppets. Like our old friends the European Movement, who I indeed see at conference here today. Which according to the last set of figures released from 2013, received grants totalling €570,000. Notably, for all their protestations of financial independence, that included a grant to the UK branch and another to the Scottish one. You, of course, are probably not one of them either. You did not get a grant to subsidise your turning up to some commissioner's office to tell him that he needs to pass more laws. The Eurogroupies have that advantage over you. They slot into the narrow slither at the heart of the Venn diagram between us and the 13th floor of the Benimont building. They are the chosen priests, communicating to a higher authority behind the cloister wall. They are the intermediaries, the elect, sponsored to channel the ideology and mantra of European integration like the Pythian Oracle on behalf of a Delphic god. Decisions over the EU have not been for the European public to make. You might, after all, make the wrong choice. Hence we are at a new paradigm of democracy. Our continent's leaders push and pull and shake and kick us down the integration paths as much as they can think that they can get away with on a given day. Happily, by and large, in this country, we have an alert press, helped in particular by campaign groups that try to keep tabs on what is going on. Keep up the good work, TFA. But even so, the complexities of the subject matter and the scale of the legislation is such that our steamy, obfuscated jungles of EU legislative plant life hide a major biomass of peculiar life forms that still keep crummy creeping out of the undergrowth and surprising us with their bite. That's where the problem clearly lies. If Europe was an abstract or a generalised framework, lying somewhere between the Council of Europe, Jeux Sans Frontières, and the Management Council of Disneyland Europe, people would be willing to turn along with a bit of flag-waving and continental camaraderie. But there is a slack heap side to this Europe and you business. Your opinion might not be sought, but you bear the brunt anyway. You pay the cost of the CAP, £398 per household per year in higher food bills and subsidies. You pay the cost of the CFP, another £186 per household per year, much more, of course, if your livelihood directly depends on our ports. You are increasingly paying the cost in terms of your electricity bills, thanks to unilateral carbon taxing and the wider environmental policies driving us towards reliance on inefficient wind. You are paying the cost in businesses and in jobs as Central Europe's social agenda digs across into our traditional flexible way of doing business. Then of course there's all that red tape we were hearing about coming from a burden of acquis communautaire that's grown so big that observers have once again practically lost track of exactly how many pages it properly runs to. It's been 10 years now since the Commission stopped even doing just the summary list of all the legislation because they physically couldn't get it into a single bound copy. The EU, then, is not about you. It is upon you. It is with you and around you. It is so seeped into our lives, so all-encompassing, it covers us like a slick. With a political schizophrenia that this generates, I would suggest that it's time to give up the Thorazine. <coughs> Whether it's through a massive hard-wall renegotiation that takes us to a looser trade affinity, or by a simple jump, we just can't go on like this. Better off out. <laughs>